I'm Dr. Arthur Fleischer, uh, Chief of Ultrasound at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, Nashville, Tennessee. This talk will cover the applications of transvaginal sonography in a variety of endometrial disorders, including hyperplasia, uh, polyps, and carcinoma. This presentation will cover the use of transvaginal sonography in evaluating the endometrium and endometrial disorders. It will cover the technical factors including scan technique and instrumentation to optimize imaging of the endometrium. I will cover the endometrium in premenopausal and perimenopausal women as well as postmenopausal women and I will discuss the sonographic findings in various endometrial disorders such as hyperplasia and cancer. And I'll talk about the application of transvaginal sonography in evaluating women who are on hormone replacement therapy and just mention the application of transvaginal sonography in evaluating the endometrium using sonohistorography. Basically, the use of transvaginal sonography in postmenopausal patients who have bleeding is to evaluate those patients that need endometrial biopsy and also patients that need sonohistorography and DNC. And of course, to evaluate patients that are having bleeding in patients on a hormone replacement. And transvaginal and or transrectal sonography provides a means for guided biopsy of endometrial disorders. Basically, the technical aspects of providing excellent images of the endometrium focuses around understanding that the endometrium is an unusual and somewhat irregular geometry, and that we must use the probe and image the entire endometrium in different scan planes uh, to assess its texture and integrity. We have to have focal areas that correspond to the level of the endometrium. The endometrium also is affected by the patient's weight. In fact, patients that are heavier have more thick endometrium, and certainly patients with fibroids may have the endometrium that is displaced by submucosal fibroids. I prefer doing the patient on a a pelvic examination table to let their legs relax and use the non-transducer hand to move the uterus to some degree to optimize imaging of the endometrium. The endometrium is basically a specialized mucous membrane. It has both a functional layer which is built up and shed in patients that are of childbearing age and a basal layer which uh, is not shed. As you can see from this diagram, in the menstrual phase, the endometrium is irregular due to sloughing, usually the first three to five uh, days of the cycle. After that, there's a gradual buildup of the endometrium with the glandular elements still being rather small and the spiral vessels uh, being rather uh, small and confined to the functional layer. In the secretory phase, the endometrium thickens, the glandular elements become distended, and there is a ischemic phase in the last few days of the cycle where there's decreased flow to the endometrium, which predates uh, sloughing. The graph on the bottom basically covers what is a typical bilayer thickness in the anterior-posterior plane in normal endometrium. As you can see, in the secretory phase, the endometrium can measure up to 12 millimeters, but typically measures between 6 and 8 millimeters uh, during this phase. Now, I will be showing you the pictures of the endometrium, and I think it's important to realize that we can image the endometrium
uh, w by observing the layers in the myometrium. The myometrium is made up of three layers. The inner myometrium uh, is the more longitudinally oriented uh, of these. The middle layer of the myometrium, which runs from the inner layer to the arcuate layer is shown here, and then the outer myometrium corresponding to these areas in the drawing inner, the spiral layer, and the outer layer of myometrium. I mention these because you can use these to determine whether or not you have a, a complete evaluation of the endometrium. Here in the long axis we can see the endometrium starting here at the cervical corporal junction extending into the fundus and we can measure the endometrium in the greatest anterior posterior plane. We have an outer hypoechoic area which is the inner myometrium. We have the spiral layer or the middle layer followed by the outer layer of myometrium and this is in the long plane. When we turn the transducer 90 degrees we can see the endometrium as a linear interface. The inner myometrium, which is hypoechoic, the spiral layer, which is more echogenic, and then the outer layer of myometrium is very nicely shown here. When we turn the probe 90 degrees to that, an image in the long axis plane, we can get a more transverse image of the endometrium as shown in this diagram. This is not the proper plane for measurement in the anterior-posterior plane since this represents the transverse dimension of the endometrium and a lot of patients will have a uterus that is somewhat rotated. And we can see it makes a big difference in the measurement of the endometrium whether you're measuring the transverse dimension as shown here in the same patient. We're rotating the probe and we're getting a five millimeter endometrium which is much, much less than the transverse plane. So it's very important to be attuned to these details when you measure the endometrium. And this is another example of measuring in a retroflexed uterus the transverse dimension of the endometrium, which is not the same as the bilayer thickness. This is the endometrium in a patient who has a retroflexed uterus where the fundus is oriented uh, toward this part of the screen. And you can see here that this is the correct measurement of the bilayer thickness of the endometrium. Now, there's about a 1.5 to 2 millimeter inter-observer variation in measurement of the endometrium. And I think this should be kept in mind when we say we have a 7 millimeter endometrium, that could be anywhere from five millimeters uh, to nine millimeters. Now it's important to have the highest frequency probe that is focused in the area of the endometrium. This is uh, two examples of probes. This is a tight curved array uh, probe operating at a nominal frequency of five millimeter, five megahertz, whereas this is a higher frequency probe with a more compact uh, footprint as you can see here and we would want to image the endometrium with that probe. And here, visually, is the difference between the older probe with a lower frequency showing an echogenic area in the endometrium. With the higher frequency probe, we can see, in fact, that what we have here are multiple small clots within the endometrium in a patient who had just undergone endometrial biopsy. This is another uh, measurement error that is not uncommon, and that is including the inner myometrium in the measurement of the endometrium. As you can see here, this is the proper measurement. This is a measurement including the inner myometrium. As you can see in this, this patient, there's an apparent thickening of the endometrium, which was originally measured to be 22 millimeters when in fact the endometrium is only about nine millimeters and what is happening is this submucosal fibroid is displacing the endometrium making it look uh, thick. Another variation one can see is the C-section 
scar can be rather prominent in some patients. As you can see here, this is not the endometrial interface. Now, what is the normal thickness of the endometrium in postmenopausal women? There have been many studies that have uh, looked at this, and basically they've asked different questions. In some studies, they've asked, what is the typical measurement which implies atrophy or tissue insufficient for diagnosis should you do an endometrial biopsy? And the answer there is around four millimeters. Uh, we used a six millimeter cutoff and found a 98% true negative as a screening test for endometrial disorders. This is an example of a thin endometrial interface that is normal. Here's an example of an endometrium that was thought to be a few millimeters when in fact the endometrium histologically is only a few cell layers and sometimes mucus can give the appearance of a thickened endometrium. It's not uncommon in postmenopausal women to see a small amount of fluid in the lumen and here's an example of, of that with the thin single layer thickness and a small amount of fluid. We did a study where we looked at endometrial thickness and compared it to endometrial biopsy in 1,733 postmenopausal women. And we found that there was a grouping of endometrial thicknesses typically less than six millimeters and greater than six millimeters with less than six millimeters being the most common. When we looked at the histology in these patients, as you can see from this bar graph, that the majority of endometrial uh, abnormalities were, were greater than six millimeters. But there were a few shown in this graph that were actually less than six millimeters. And uh, astonishingly enough, there were uh, two cancers that were less than six millimeters. But this is extremely rare. And here's an example of some of these pathologies in patients with less than six millimeters thickness. This is a uh, three and four millimeter endometrium that turned out to be hyperplastic. And this was an unusual case in a retroflex uterus here of a thin endometrium in a patient who had diffuse endometrial cancer that just spread around the entire surface. When we looked at our data using six millimeters, we found the positive predictive value was not very good. But the negative predictive value, that is, if an endometrium is less than six millimeters, that it was negative, was very high. So uh, it is clear that we can use the thickness of the endometrium to exclude disease. However, there are cases when endometrial thicknesses greater than six millimeters uh, were seen in even normal cases. So we must not just focus on the thickness of the endometrium but look at its texture. For example, here's a patient that has a polyp. And if one would image in this plane, you would see a totally normal endometrium. So we need to take into account the texture and regularity of the endometrium. The use of 3D has radically improved the ability to diagnose endometrial disorders. And this is a very early example of where an endometrial polyp was seen on 3D that wasn't really that apparent on the 2D image. Now in 3D imaging of the endometrium, basically this is the long axis plane shown in the A plane. And be, due to uh, the tipping of the image uh, with the fundus being at the top, it looks like it's a retroflex uterus uh, where it's, that's just the display of it. In the orthogonal view to A, we have this plane, which is the short axis view, and then the coronal plane uh, is shown here with the fundus oriented to the top of the image. And this is, of course, the sample volume where we can see um, the entire um, endometrium. And this is an example of a retroflex uterus with a normal appearing endometrium on long axis, short axis, in the coronal plane and on the sample volume. Again, an example of the normal endometrium
beautifully shown in the corneal regions uh, on this 3D coronal image. So we can use this to evaluate uh, uterine abnormalities, and this is an example uh, of a uterine didelphus. And the biggest uh, area that we need to depict on 3D, the most important area is the fundus of the uterus. And where there's a dip in the fundal region, we know that that is a bicornial uterus um, as opposed to where there's no dip, this is a septated uterus or an arcuous uterus. And you can see the two endometrial interfaces in this patient with a didelphic uterus. The 3D can also uh, show beautifully the polyp, and not only the polyp, but the pedicle where the attachment is to the rest of the endometrium. 3D is also very helpful for depiction of a submucosal fibroid to determine, uh, again, the attachment of the fibroid to the rest of the myometrium and the displacement of the surrounding endometrium in a patient with a submucosal fibroid. This was lent to me by Anna Levtov, uh, showing a th beautiful 3D image after installation of fluid of a sessile polyp that is very broad-based, as you can see here. Well, sonohistorography or saline infusion sonohistorography is used when we can't be sure whether there in fact is a polyp. And we used to do this much more uh, uh, before we had 3D sonography because 3D sonography can answer many of these questions. And the questions are whether the endometrial disorder is diffuse or in fact whether it's focal. And to answer this, we can insert a flexible thin catheter, ins install, instill some fluid, and uh, depict the uh, lumen of the uterus. Um, this is a, a normal example of sonohistogram. This is an example of a small polyp shown after installation of just a small amount of fluid. And sonohistography is very helpful in this uh, regard. In patients that have uh, postmenopausal bleeding, it's important to realize that uh, this may be associated with endometrial polyps, particularly in the perimenopausal age group. And this was a study uh, performed by Ted Dubinsky, where he evaluated about 300 patients with a negative endometrial biopsy. And many of these patients, in fact, showed polyps. In fact, 14 malignancies were found. And in this same patient, I hope you can appreciate the, the appearance of a polyp uh, beautifully with a little bit of fluid surrounding it. Uh, Dr. Bree and coworkers found that sonohistorography improves the certainty of the diagnosis and, in fact, changed the treatment in many patients. Some of the pitfalls of sonohistorography are incomplete distension, a space-occupying lesion, and in some instances where um, the catheter is not preloaded with fluid, you can inject some air and it may, may in fact, uh, make things very difficult to depict. And this is a polyp that is actually very proximal. Uh, one would have to slip the catheter past this do some injection to entirely delineate this polyp. Patients that have cycles are uh, different than postmenopausal women in that patients with bleeding um, that are of childbearing age or perimenopausal, it's usually due to corpus luteum that uh, fails to support the endometrium. And uh, you can see in some of these patients the endometrium can be up to uh, 12 millimeters, as I, as I discussed earlier in the secretory phase. We're more concerned about the patient with bleeding that is postmenopausal, but even in these patients, the most common cause is atrophy. So sonography has a pivotal role to determine which patients undergo biopsy. We also should be aware that there is clearly a precursor of cancer, and that is atypical hyperplasia and if we detect this, uh, we know that this patient is at risk for developing 
endometrial cancer. In those patients with postmenopausal bleeding, only about 1 in 10 or so will actually have cancer. The ma vast majority will have atrophy, a very thin endometrium which uh, leads to erosions and bleeding. And this is a typical thin endometrium that we can see in women with atrophy. We also need to take into account that there are known risk factors in patients with endometrial cancer, and that is patients that are diabetic, large, and uh, some patients that take uh, tamoxifen. And endometrial cancer is a very common cancer in postmenopausal women, but luckily it has a symptom that is bleeding that leads to its workup. This is a study that was done uh, in Scandinavia where the endometrial thickness was plotted and you can see that in this receiver operating curve that most cancers were over um, uh, six millimeters and that it had very high uh, predictive value. Now patients that are having uh, that are receiving hormone replacement are decreasing ever since the Women's Health Initiative showed a higher incidence of, of breast cancer associated with this therapy. But some patients still uh, undergo some form of either estrogen supplementation or are on a CIRM, which is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. And the most common one of these is tamoxifen or roloxifen. Now, one should uh, be aware that the endometrium in patients on HRT uh, should be about the same in thickness as patients not on HRT. And this, these are several studies which have shown that patients on hormone replacement have about the same thickness of the endometrium. And this is important because patients on hormone replacement will still have bleeding. In fact, it's not uncommon up to three months to have bleeding. Here are a few examples of patients on hormone replacement that had uh, abnormal endometria, as you can see here. This is a 13 millimeter bilayer thickness. This patient had hyperplasia. And after D and C, you can see a very thin endometrium. This patient had bleeding, and the endometrium is slightly thickened, but also very irregular. And this is a patient with an endometrial carcinoma this patient had endometrial carcinoma that had invaded into the inner myometrium, as shown right here. Now, it's not uncommon for patients that have bleeding, and one may find, a, a, in fact, a mass on transvaginal, and the pathology comes back negative. This is typical of patients with polyps, that the polyp indeed is missed by the, the, uh, the endometrial biopsy papel, and the surrounding area is, is in fact atrophic. And here is an example where uh, sonohistrography was very helpful in um, identifying an area of abnormality in the, end, in the endometrium that was actually missed by initial biopsy. As you can see here, there's focal thickening of the endometrium and um, the other area of the endometrium is relatively atrophic. Now, CIRMs, or selective estrogen receptor modulators, are um, basically a class of drugs that are used to prevent osteoporosis, decreasing um, the uh, possibility of fracture of, of bones, but they clearly do have an um, increased risk of deep vein thrombosis, and uh, we have been involved with study of these uh, medications just for those people that are curious. The, these, um, these drugs mask the receptor sites and the most common one of these is tamoxifen. Tamoxifen is give, given to patients with breast cancer to uh, decrease recurrence rates. It's also uh, been shown unfortunately to be associated with increased incidence of a very specific type of hyperplasia, as well as patients that have uh, carcinoma. And here's an example of a, a thin endometrium in a patient on tamoxifen. Uh, 
And it's not uncommon in patients on, on tamoxifen to see these little cystic areas in the inner myometrium, which represent reactivated foci of adenomyosis. And here's another example of these clefts associated with adenomyosis. This is an older case where uh, a hystero uh, salpingogram was done showing uh, these diverticuli associated with adenomyosis. Now, uh, tamoxifen can also be associated with a polyp, and in this case, we have cysts inside the polyp, uh, very nicely shown on transvaginal sonography. Now, whether or not patients are actually followed on tamoxifen is the choice the clinician has to make, but uh, this was a study which showed that there was an unfortunate high rate of perforation of the uterus when these uh, polyps and endometrial thickening uh, was worked up by endometrial biopsy. So basically, most patients, unless they have bleeding, uh, will not undergo uh, sonography. So these hypoechoic areas in the inner myometrium, there's, of course, a, a differential diagnosis, but these are most commonly associated with adenomyotic uh, foci. Now, sometimes these cystic spaces are seen within polyps, uh, as shown in these slides. There is a drug called Evista uh, that does not stimulate the postmenopausal endometrium and, in fact, uh, is um, given uh, in patients with a history of, of breast cancer. Um, we s studied a drug which uh, was called idoxifen, and I show these slides because uh, there are subtle changes of the endometrium we can see on sonography that in fact um, are not found on pathology and I wanted to just show you some examples of these. Um, here is a patient, the, these were all patients that were followed up three months after starting this drug with endometrial biopsy. This is a normal endometrium and three months later you can see some thickening and this was a negative endometrial biopsy even though the um, uh, findings on sonography showed some thickening. Another patient who starts out with this endometrium and ends up with some cystic changes. So my point is that sometimes the endometrial biopsy don't show changes that we see on sonography. Another patient with these little hypoechoic areas in the inner myometrium that are probably reactivated adenomyomas. Um, and we can see that again in this patient, and we can see the uh, little cystic areas associated with adenomyosis. And this patient underwent MR uh, showing these adenomyotic foci in, in a patient. So um, there are many causes of false positive of endometrium that uh, I wanted just to discuss. I'm showing you some examples of adenomyotic foci that appear as cystic areas. But histologically, cystic atrophy can be associated with thickening of the endometrium primarily because of multiple interfaces uh, produced by the microscopic cysts. False negative, incomplete delineation, poor patient cooperation, um, and substandard equipment. Now, I, these slides were lent to me by Anna Parsons, who many uh, years ago now uh, looked at uh, areas that we saw, that she saw that were abnormal on transvaginal sonography and did histology in, in those areas. And here is what appears to be a thickened endometrium. Uh, when sampled right here, we found these cystic areas um, in so-called cystic uh, atrophy of the endometrium. This echogenic focus right here uh, and uh, represented an adenomyotic foci. So adenomyosis can give a very abnormal uh, image in the, endo in the uh, myometrium 
and displace the endometrium, in fact, as you can see in this example. And in adenomyosis, the uh, vascular supply is different from fibroids in that it's scattered. And on 3D, we can see that the thickened endometrium, myometrium can in fact displace uh, the endometrium. So uh, transvaginal sonography has an important role in the evaluation of endometrial disorders. One has to be very careful to image in uh, scan planes that are uh, relative to the endometrium and uh, look at the endometrium in some cases uh, using sonohistorography. So I've uh, shown you where the role of transvaginal sonography in patients with postmenopausal bleeding is to decide which patients need endometrial biopsy. Now sometimes uh, this patient, I, after showing a two millimeter endometrium, uh, underwent endometrial biopsy because the clinician was insistent and the tissue came back uh, insufficient for diagnosis. Um, in a meta-analysis by Smith Beinman, uh, she showed that when the endometrium was less than five millimeters and the patient had no real risk factors for endometrial carcinoma, this basically excludes um, the possibility of endometrial cancer. And this finding did not vary in patients who underwent hormone replacement. So in other words, transvaginal sonography is an excellent means to screen patients uh, for endometrial carcinoma. Unfortunately, there's a high level of operator dependency of transvaginal uh, sonography but I think if you use six millimeters as your uh, general guideline for which patients need biopsy, which patients can be followed up, um, that is very helpful. I want to mention briefly the use of color Doppler in endometrial disorders. The endometrium is supplied by uh, vessels coming from the arcuate, the radial vessels that come into the endometrium by the spiral vessels and there are some basal layer uh, vessels. But in patients with polyps, typically the spiral vessel is enlarged. Here's a color Doppler showing the uh, radial vessels. As you can see, histologically, we find a few small vessels in the endometrial layer. These represent the spiral layer, spiral vessels, as shown on this uh, image uh, of the histology, these are the glandular elements. As I mentioned, most polyps will drag a, a feeding vessel into them. In fact, it makes it very clear that um, this is a polyp, for example, that has a big vascular pedicle. This is a big polyp with multiple uh, vessels as opposed to a patient with hematometria that has uh, little or no vessels uh, within the center. This is a patient who had infertility. The polyp is shown here with its feeding vessel. This is a patient that had fluid. We did not instill fluid. She presented with this amount of fluid in the lumen. These polyps are very irregular. And as you can see, some of the large feeding vessels is shown here. Um, this is the hysteroscopic uh, picture of these polyps that were found to be uh, endometrial carcinoma. I want to mention briefly the use of transrectal sonography um, and specifically biplane transrectal sonography for difficult patients that may have cervical stenosis. Um, these uh, probes have a linear array here and an axial orientation of the transducers at the top and a condom is put over the uh, probe and the probe is introduced transrectally. And as you can see, the field of view is very limited to the cervix and part of the uh, uterus, but it's very helpful. Um, for example, here's a patient that on transvaginal sonography has an ex echogenic area in the myometrium. These are two or three images, four images from a 
transrectal, where this is posterior, this is anterior, this is inferior, this is superior. And we could help guide the gynecologist in putting the, the uh, dilator right into the area of the cervix. And um, finally, you can see its location within the lumen uh, is very clear. This is a patient with a very abnormal cervix. The dilator is going too posteriorly and when corrected, went in uh, beautifully. So here's the, the dilator going into the cervix and we could see that it's uh, in the proper position. The retractors uh, have to be out toward the side to get uh, the, a good image. Now the actual uh, curatage instrument is being introduced. We could confirm that it is luminal by um, activating the axially oriented transducer. So we're going to do that and see. So now this is posterior, right, left, and we're moving the probe. And um, here is here will be the uterus. Right here, this echogenic area is the dilator and we could confirm that we're indeed in the lumen of this uh, uterus. Now we're back in long axis. The curatage instrument is now uh, obtaining the endometrial tissue. And uh, I highly recommend this technique in the difficult patient. Um, here's a patient that uh, unfortunately, the bladder was not distended enough. This is the uterus, and um, the, the dilator could be seen going right through the uterus into a bowel loop. And um, when we corrected for a non-distended bladder, we got into the uterus um, perfectly. So what I've tried to do in this review is to show you that transrectal and transvaginal sonography has a very important role in evaluating patients with endometrial disorders. It's very important that one uh, gets the entire endometrium either uh, manually or by 3D and understand the endometrial uh, disorders are different in premenopausal and perimenopausal women as compared to postmenopausal women where one is uh, thinking about endometrial cancer. Uh, hyperplasia and cancer can be diagnosed and uh, one can use sonohistorography for further evaluation. Thank you.